Go and gather the elders of Israel together and say to them, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob, appeared to me, saying, I have surely visited you and seen what is done to you in Egypt. And I have said I will bring you out of the affliction of Egypt to the land of the Canaanites and the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, to a land flowing with milk and honey. Then they will heed your voice, and you shall come, you and the elders of Israel, to the king of Egypt. And you shall say to him, The Lord God of the Hebrews has met with us, and now please let us go three days' journey into the wilderness that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. But I am not sure that the king of Egypt will not, but I am sure that the king of Egypt will not let you go. No, not even by a mighty hand. So I will stretch out my hand and strike Egypt with all my wonders, which I will do in its midst. And after that, he will let you go. And I will give you this, and I will give this people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. And it shall be when you go that you shall not go empty handed. But every woman shall ask of her neighbor, namely of her who dwells near her house, articles of silver, articles of gold and clothing, and you shall put them on your sons and on your daughters. So you shall plunder the Egyptians. Then Moses answered and said, but suppose they will not believe me or listen to my voice. Suppose they say the Lord has not appeared to you. So the Lord said to him, what is that in your hand? He said, a rod. And he said, cast it on the ground. So he cast it on the ground, and it became a serpent, and Moses fled from it. Then the Lord said to Moses, Reach out your hand and take it by the tail. And he reached out his hand and caught it, and it became a rod in his hand, that they may believe that the Lord God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has appeared to you. Furthermore, the Lord said to him, Now put your hand in your bosom. And he put his hand in his bosom, and when he took it out, behold, his hand was leprous like snow. And he said, put your hand in your bosom again. So he put his hand in his bosom again and drew it out of his bosom. And behold, it was restored like his other flesh. Then it will be if they do not believe you nor heed the message of the first sign that they may believe the message of the latter sign. And it shall be if they do not believe even these two signs or listen to your voice that you shall take water from the river and pour it on the dry land. The water which you take from the river will become blood on the dry land. Then Moses said to the Lord, O my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither before nor since you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. So the Lord said to him, Who has made man's mouth, or who makes the mute, the deaf, the seeing, or the blind? Have not I the Lord? Now therefore go, and I will be with your mouth and teach you what you shall say. But he said, O my Lord, please send by my by the hand of whomever else you may send. So the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses, and he said, Is not Aaron the Levite your brother? I know that he can speak well. And look, he is also coming out to meet you. When he sees you, he will be glad in his heart. Now you shall speak to him and put the words in his mouth, and I will be with your mouth and with his mouth, and I will teach you what you shall do. So he shall be your spokesperson to the people, and he himself shall be as a mouth for you, and you shall be to him as God. And you shall take this rod in your hand, with which you shall do the signs. Praise the Lord for his word. Thank Amen. You. Thank you, Hannah. What if I were to say to you that all of our spiritual problems go back to a view of God that is too small? What if I was to say to you, probably most of our problems tend to go back to an understanding of God that says he's not enough. Could it be that all the things we're wrestling with in our lives is because we don't understand God in all his fullness and glory? So 12.30 this morning, uh, I was awakened by this. Come out of your house with your hands up. This, this usually doesn't happen in our neighborhood. <laughs> Not that we live in the high rent district. John Flynn, we have a warrant for your arrest. Come out of your house with your hands on your head. Neighbors start lighting up text messaging, phone calls. What is going on? 5065, Jupiter Way, John Flynn, we have a warrant for your arrest. Come out with your hands on your head. Now everyone's getting to the best window they can get to, <laughs> to get a view of what's happening. 
and 50 yards from our house, we see the lights. There's a drone hanging out over this house, 20 minutes. John Flynn, come out of your house. Flash bombs going off. John's not cooperating. And eventually, it all is dismissed because guess who decided to surrender? Now, I'm going to venture out and say John Flynn probably has a small view of God in his life. Can I get an amen? And don't think as if you're, whoa, you guys haven't seen moves like that since, I don't know, whenever. I'm going to guess that your lives are not unlike John's life, where maybe the police haven't showed up to your house, but guess what? You've made some decisions that haven't been the best decisions because you've left God out of the equation. I've said it this way. We try to fill legitimate needs illegitimately. All of us hunger and thirst for something that only God can satisfy, but our problem is we stop so far less of God and we try to fill it with other stuff. And you know what ends up happening? Our world collapses on us. We, we fall short of what God desires to give us. We settle for, for less. So John Flynn is not alone in his troubles and his difficulties. If, if, if you were to sit with John right now, we're probably downtown city jail, <laughs> guessing. You know, John would say, yep, I did not want to be here. John, what's your understanding of God? Far too small. Far too small. This is why this passage in Exodus 3 is so important. And we started last week with this conversation where God appears to Moses and says to Moses, I am enough. I am all you need. I am greater than you can ever imagine. I am strong. I am holy. I am self-sufficient. I don't need you. But I am loving. I am merciful. I am a reconciler. I am a father. I am a friend. Our, our problems in life tend to go back to a view of God that is far too small. History is filled with men and women who have tried to call us back to understanding who God is because nothing else is worth our time. What you think about God, what you know about God is greatly going to determine your life today. And if it's anything short of satisfying, you, you, you've not seen God. You've not viewed God. You've not understood God. Oh, I pray that we would have a sense of the psalmist's words, Psalm 46. Write this down. Look at it later. This is a great passage. I love Psalm 46. It starts out this way. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Though we will not fear, though the earth gives away, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, Though its waters roar and foam, though we look around us and there's a lot of tumultuous activity, though a pandemic tries to fear, fear, put fear into people, though political divisions continue to make people separate from one another, though I, I get sick and my body is wasting away, though I, I may face difficulties in my relationship with my wife or my children, though anything around me may fall apart and crash and collapse and be destroyed, I will find my refuge in you and then later on in this psalm is where the psalmist says those famous words be still and know that I am God boy we we have fashioned for ourselves a God who's not much better than us let's just be honest we have fashioned for ourselves a God that maybe a little bit bigger version of ourselves. 
always eager to please, emotionally vulnerable, surprised when we struggle, saddened by our pain, impotent to help in anything. And when darkness and chaos and sin and sadness and death and disease attack our lives, a God like that that we've manufactured will never be enough. Ladies and gentlemen, only a God like we just read in Psalm 46 is enough for our hearts that are breaking and broken in a world like ours. We don't need a God who's like this cosmic life coach. You know what I'm saying? The one who just throws punchy one-liners out there, pep talks to encourage us in our way, and, and yet utterly powerless to change our lives. We need to, to recapture this sense of the great I am. Jehovah God, utterly mighty, incredibly sovereign, this uncreated fire, independent and holy, who invites us to come to him, but not haphazardly, not recklessly, not, not with, with our rules, but by his rules, take off your sandals, for you are standing on holy ground before a self-sufficient, mighty, holy God. I don't want your God. I want the God. Because this is the God who proves himself time and time again. You need me. And perhaps we've never felt that sense of desperation. John Flynn's feeling a sense of desperation perhaps this morning. But maybe some of us are not yet, there yet. We haven't reached that point where the psalmist says in Psalm 42, my soul and my, my heart hungers and thirsts for you. Like the, the deer that pants for the water, so my soul longs for you. Have we even come to that place yet? God is... Is talking to Moses and saying, Moses, before you need to know your plans for your life, you need to understand me. Before you venture out and just think that this is about you and you have no sense of direction, listen to me. Pay attention to me. Know me. I'm going to give you a, a sentence. And I like this sentence. It was inspired by something else I read, but I put this together for us this morning. And, 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 a, and a preacher always says, this preaches right here. This preaches. So this is our outline today, but let me, let me give it to you in total. The plan of God will never lead you where the power of God won't enable you and the promises of God can't encourage you. How's this for a life motto? The plan of God, which is what will bring you the deepest joy and satisfaction, understanding his will, the plan of God will never lead you to where the power of God won't enable you. He will always give you the strength to do what he wants you to do. That's why sometimes God's plan seems crazy. It seems outlandish. It seems like it's so beyond us. And that's exactly where God wants to bring us, where we realize we can't, but he can so the power of God will enable us, and while we're on this journey, the promises of God will encourage us. Because all the yes and amens and promises of God are, are the yes and amens in Jesus. And so this is what I want to tease out this morning. Now, full disclosure, we'll only get to plan and power, and we'll save promises for next time. So there's a to be continued, which means if the Lord should tarry and we come back together, we'll dive into the rest of this. But here we go. The plan, the power, the promises. Let's work through this. Chapter 3, Exodus, starting in verse 16. Now we met Moses at the beginning of chapter 3 at, in a very insecure place. He is 40 years in the Midian wilderness. Living in obscurity. Why? Because he has realized he's a failure. He is weak. He has made mistakes. Maybe he's a little bit harder on himself than he ought to be. Anyone else guilty of that? Yeah. And he's out tending sheep that don't even belong to him. They're his father-in-law's sheep. And he's in the backside of the Midian, Midian wilderness, living in obscurity and, and somewhat happy with that. And God interrupts him in that isolated place and says, I'm not done with you yet. Now remember, Moses, Moses started out pretty well. He says about himself, he was a good-looking guy. Beware of anyone who 
who talks like this, but he, he says he was a good-looking guy. <coughs> he was born with a scepter in his hand because, remember, Pharaoh adopted him into his household. He had all the things money could buy. He was guaranteed success. He could not fail because of the environment he was in. But the moment he ventured out to do what he believed God put on his heart, he did fail. And now he considers himself an abject failure and totally useless to God. Here's the good news. God finds him and says, I'm not done with you yet. Here's the good news for every single person in this room. God ain't done with you yet. You may have written yourself off because of some mistake, some failure. But the good news is, if you still have life and breath, God can still use you. And may I say, God still wants to use you. You just have to get past looking at yourself. Right? Self-absorption, preoccupation with you is going to hinder your walk with God. He's not done with any one of us. And I truly believe that. Amen? So what can we learn? Even as Moses works through his objections, imagine having... No one objects to the Lord like Moses objects to the Lord. He's, he's got five objections. We looked at two of them last week. Like, who am I? God's like, it doesn't matter who you are, but you want to talk about that? Okay, let's talk about that. Then he says, who are you? And God says, I am. And what I love about the I am statement found in verse 14, I am is more concerned, less, it's less concerned about name and more concerned about his being. He is everything. He is sovereign. He is majestic. He is holy. He is just. I mean, God is, God is, is beyond our wildest imaginations, yet he chooses to disclose himself to us. And now we shift into some more objections as we start, and we talk about, first point, assurance of God's plan. And this is what we need to understand, is that God has a plan, and nothing or no one could thwart his plan. Here's the good news. God is sovereign, he's in control of all things, and nothing can stop the hand of the Lord. Look at verse 16 in Exodus 3. Here's what's amazing about this passage. God tells Moses exactly how things are going to play out. And Moses still challenges the Lord. Like, Moses, here's what's going to happen. It's like me saying to Max, Max, in two hours you're going to be sitting with a Subway sandwich, right? What do you like? A, a, a turkey with bacon on it? Sure, let's go with it. Turkey with bacon on it. <laughs> Foot long, toasted, all the sauces. Two hours from now, you're going to sit with a Subway sandwich, a bag of chips, and a, and a Coke, and that's guaranteed to happen. And Max goes, no, it's not. And guess what? Two hours from now, guess where Max is sitting? In Subway, eating that sandwich, right? It's a clear defiance of saying to the Lord, like, I don't know the future like God knows the future. I don't know if Max likes even Subway, right? He may choose Jimmy John's. I don't care. Who's hungry right now? I am just really <laughs> stoking that fire right now. But here's the Lord God saying, Moses, here, here's how things are going to play out. Now, when the Lord is telling you about what the future holds, you better pay attention. Look at verse 16. Go ahead, Moses, and gather the elders of Israel together. These are the leaders of Israel who are under bondage in slavery for the past 400 plus years under the mighty hand of Egypt, you're to go to the spiritual leaders of Israel, Moses, gather them together and say, the Lord, the God, your fathers, the Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob has appeared to me saying, I am indeed concerned about you and what has been done to you in Egypt. So listen to this. He's going to go to a group of people he hasn't seen in 40 years. Some of these people might recognize him. Like, you're the dude who tried to step up and be our deliverer. And there are going to be people who don't even know him, right? All I know is that Moses is facing an uphill battle. Like, you're, you're going to send me back to Israel. I'm supposed to gather the elders, and I'm supposed to tell them that the Lord spoke to me. You know, you, you do that today. People are like totally, totally suspicious. There's a guy named Oral Roberts several years ago who said, the Lord told me that I need to collect $9 million in donations so I can buy myself a jet plane. And I'm sitting there going, 
He goes, and if I don't get $9 million, the Lord's going to strike me dead. I'm like, see you in eternity, Oral. <laughs> Guess what? He got $10 million plus from people. Be wary of anyone who tells you, the Lord told me this. Unless they connect it to Scripture. Here's how the Lord speaks. Through this. The Lord doesn't come to you. I wish. Look, trust me. I drive a 20-year-old car. I would love to drive a brand new Toyota 4Runner. As a matter of fact, I had a dream last night. And the Lord came. <laughs> no, I'm not. That's a $50,000, $60,000 car. It's not $9 million. But unless you guys raise $60,000 million, $60, for me, the Lord's going to strike me dead. You're like, we don't believe you. Unless you connect it to Scripture, it holds no value. And I will, I will guarantee you to tell you, you think the Lord is spe speaking to you? I bet you had chili for dinner. That's what's talking, baby. <laughs> so I'm going to go tell these guys that the Lord spoke to me. And, but what Moses says, and, here, and here's what the Lord says to Moses. Tell them I care about them. Tell them I haven't forgotten them. Tell them I still have a plan for my people. I love that. I love it because this is a group of people who for 400 plus years hasn't heard the voice of God. Imagine 400 years, God is silent as far as we can tell, and Moses is going to be the spokesperson to say, hey guys, God still loves you. God still wants to do something with you. And look what it says. So I said, to, I will bring you up out of this affliction of Egypt, verse 17, to the land of Canaanite, the Hittite, the Amorite, the Perizzites, the Mosquito Bites, the Hevites. You guys know all the Jebusites. Never gets old. It never gets old. A land flowing with milk and honey. So Moses, this is what you're supposed to say. And I know what Moses is thinking. They're not going to listen to me. Here is the plan of God, number one. He will overcome their doubt. How do I know that? Read verse 18. And they will pay heed to what you say. Moses, they will listen. Can we, can we be honest? Sometimes we not only want to control the content, we want to control the outcome. We not only want to give the message, we want to make sure we can control the results. Ladies and gentlemen, give up on that fight right now. God holds you responsible to do what he has told you to do, and you're always to leave the results up to him. Here's what he tells to Israel. Moses, Israel will listen to you. Verse 18. And you with the elders of Israel will come to the king of Egypt, i.e. Pharaoh, and you will say to him, the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, has met with us. So now please let us go a three days journey. You know what he's asking for there. Give us the three day lead time so I can lead my people out of here because they're done. But they're kind of masking something more general, almost like we just want to go on a little hike, spend some time with our God. And that's exactly what he says, right? We want to go to the wilderness that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. Can you give us three days to go worship God? I'm not saying we're coming back. He's not saying that. But look at verse 19. But I know that the king of Egypt will not permit you to go except under compulsion. I will tell you, Moses, that when you go to the king, he's not going to respond as quickly as Israel is going to respond to your message. But guess what will eventually happen he will respond, look at verse 20, so I will stretch out my hand and strike Egypt with all my miracles, i.e. plagues. We know what's going to come. But because of the hardness of Pharaoh's heart, which only God can overcome or God can affect change with, Moses, uh, Pharaoh's going to be resistant. And I shall do in the midst of it, and after that, he will let you go. So something we need to understand, sometimes God moves immediately, does what he says he's going to do. Sometimes God takes, takes time, right? There's no, there's no carte blanche general idea. Sometimes we can pray for something, and it seems like God answers that prayer immediately. Sometimes God hears our prayers, 
And we go five minutes, five hours, five days, five weeks, five, right? We, God will move at his, his clip. We just need to continue to trust him, right? Moses, Pharaoh will change his heart, but it's not going to happen at the first ask. I will cause his heart to change. And I will grant this people, verse 21, favor in the sight of the Egyptians, and it shall be that when you go, you will not leave empty-handed. Ooh, this is interesting. Look at verse 22. But every woman shall ask of her neighbor, and the woman who lives in her house will take her on a shopping spree. That's what it says. They will leave with silver and gold and clothing, and you will put them on your sons and daughters. Thus you shall plunder the Egyptians. So, there's a plan to overcome Israel's doubt, and Moses will experience that right out of the gate. The elders will respond, and they'll join you. You'll go to Pharaoh, and you'll say, we want to take the people on a retreat. He will not let you go at that moment, but watch what my mighty hand will do. God is powerful enough to overcome Pharaoh's defiance. Right? So much so that Israel, <coughs> me, Israel is going to leave blessed beyond their wildest imagination. Look at that verse 22 real quick. Here's what, here's, what, here's what God's saying. All those years working under severe hardship, I'm going to take care of Israel and make sure they get back pay. Now, this is not a violent scene because you, you read the word plundering and that's really not what's going on. Egypt, Egyptian women will gladly give the Israelite women everything they want. How do I know that? Look at Exodus 12. Check this out. Exodus 12, verses 35 through 36. Moses says, the people of Israel had also done, as Moses told them, for they had asked the Egyptians... For silver, gold jewelry, and for clothing. And the Lord had given the people, Israel, favor in the sight of the Egyptians so that they let them have what they asked. Is that awesome or what? For some reason, God moved upon the Egyptian women's hearts and said, take all that you want and need. Two things that I think of when it comes to this scene here, which, which boy, I, I, I tell you, God is saying to these people, I want to make sure you get paid for all of the work you have done for Pharaoh. When they were negligent in paying you, when they were severely beating you, I was not unaware of that. And I want you to know that I am going to reward your faithfulness. I'm going to reward your perseverance. And isn't this just like the Lord? To see the affliction of his people, to know what we're going through, and to say to us, I will reward you accordingly. Now, I'm not saying it's a dollar for dollar type exchange. But what I'm saying is that your future in Christ will be richer than anything you've experienced up to this point in living. And if you feel like you've been taken advantage of, if you feel like you've been mistreated, if you feel like you've been robbed, if you feel like you've been shortchanged, here's what I know about God. If you're in Jesus Christ, He sees what's been done to you. He sees your affliction. He sees your difficulty. And He says, I will vindicate you and make sure you are more taken care of than you could ever dream or imagine. Because what the enemy means for evil, God intends for good. Those years, those locusts have eaten away of your life, you feel like I can't get back, God knows and he will restore your tree to a fuller, more healthy fashion than you've ever dreamed of. Ladies and gentlemen, please listen to this. God knows, he sees, he cares, and he is faithful to reward those who want him more than anything this world has to offer. We don't want the gold and the silver. We want the God who oversees all the riches of the world. 
So he says to these people, I will move Pharaoh's heart and I will move the Egyptians' hearts so that you will receive what you feel has been taken from you. And not only that, here's probably the best part of all. God will use all those materials for the construction of his tabernacle that will bring glory to him. Isn't it just like God to take the things of this world and turn them on their head so that he ultimately receives the glory? Last thing we deal with in this section is, see, God's plan to overcome their doubt, God's plan to overcome Pharaoh's defiance, which we're going to see played out in the next few chapters. But ultimately, right here, right now, there's a plan to overcome Moses' deficiency. Because he's still fighting with God like, you can't use me. You, I'm a failure. I'm a loser. I have weaknesses. I have shortcomings. And it's not like God doesn't know these things. He actually waits for us to admit these things before he steps in and wants to use us. Right? Look what he says. Moses answered, verse 1, chapter 4, and said, what if they will not believe me or listen to what I said? What, what has God just told you, Moses? Don't you feel like that sometimes with people? It's like, here's something you need to know. Well, what? It's like, how many get caught in the what if spiral? What if, what if, what if? We get bogged down by things that are hypothetical and probably will not even manifest themselves. Someone wise in the faith once said, at the beginning of every week, I write down a list of all the things I'm anxious about, worried about, stressed about. Make a list. I review that list a week later, and I look back and realize 90 to 95% of those things I listed down never came to fruition. I was bothered by things that were what ifs, and I missed out on the things that what is. So Moses is playing the what if game. What if they will not believe me? What if they don't listen to what I say? What if they say the Lord has not appeared to you? Right? These are the third, this is the third objection. He says, first, who am I? Number two, who are you? But what if they don't listen? Look at verse two. He's going to overcome Moses' deficiency. And the Lord said to him, what is that in your hand? He said, a staff. Okay, stop right there. Now we're entering an interesting season in this conversation where God is going to show him some signs. Point number two, we have not only the assurance of God's plan, now we have the assurance of God's power. Remember, God will lead you by his plan, and he will never leave you to where he's not ready to empower you. Moses is still stuck on what might happen. God has already told him what would happen. You got to get out of this cycle, you guys. Right? Moses was preoccupied with himself. We have this horrible, horrible practice of being very self-absorbed, being very myopic and focused on ourselves. And God is saying, you don't need a clearer understanding of you. You need a better understanding of me. God, you know, here's what I love is that God doesn't say to us, you know what, let me deal with your insecurities by having you go get a mirror. And take that mirror and go ahead and look at yourself and say, you're smart enough and you're handsome enough and you're nice enough and doggone it, people like me. That's not the God we're talking about, right? This is not the God of self-improvement which I will tell you is the fastest growing segment of any bookstore, the self-improvement section. And you know what? You don't need self-improvement. You need self-destruction. That would be interesting to walk into a Barnes and Nobles and be like, can I find your self-destruction section? <laughs> but this is literally what God says. This is not about you. You don't need a greater understanding of your self-esteem. You don't need a better understanding of yourself. You need to forget about you and get a bigger view of God. This is what God expects. This is the only way we're able to get out of this, this death spiral. But God, I'm not good enough. And God says, but I am. But God, I, I'm not skilled enough. And God says, but I am. God says, Buddha says, I'm not confident enough. And God says, I am. See, we need to let God's amness overcome our 
meanness. Some of you are like, what did he just say? <laughs> you need to let God's amness, he is, overcome your notness or your meanness. You need to forget about you. You need to forget about your shortcomings. Because God will never, ever put you at the center and make this about you. This is always about him and his strength showing up in your weakness so that ultimately he gets the glory. Think about how Jesus did this. The ministry of Jesus so powerfully took the I am of God from Exodus 3 and, and lived it on full display with his people. Remember Jesus taking the I am statement, apply it very intimately to our areas of brokenness and need. To the, hung, to the hungry, he says, I am the bread. To the thirsty, he says, I am the living water. To those who are in darkness, he says, I am the light. To those who, who uh, are, uh, need a fresh start, he says, I'm the door. Enter. To those who feel like they've been abandoned, he says, I am the good shepherd. To those who feel lost, he says, I am the way. To those who are confused, he says, I am the truth. To those who are afraid of death, he says, I am the life. Isn't that amazing? The Christian life is not about moral improvement. Don't... Don't ever say to me, Scott, you got this. Because I don't. Don't ever say to me, Scott, you do you. No. You say, you need God. And you say, Scott, God's got you. And he's got this. Don't encourage me in myself. Encourage me in my God. The Christian life is about Christ working his power of a new life in you and through you. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live. But the life that I do now live, I live by faith in him who gave himself up for me. Who has now given me every resource under heaven so that I can live my life for him. That, that's the word. This is what we need. I, I don't want to focus on me. I need a better and greater understanding of God. So God says, Moses, I'll still deal with your stubbornness. Verse 2. And the Lord says to Moses, what is that in your hand? He says, a staff. He says, throw it on the ground. He says, and he does it. Throws it on the ground, becomes a serpent. Moses flees from it, which you and I would do. Who hates snakes? Two snake stories. Fourth grade, Phoenix Zoo came to my elementary school. Giant python is pulled out. Who wants to hold the python? Every kid's just like, <laughs> and they go, you, come here. And they put this giant python on me. PTSD. 40 plus years later. Thank you, Phoenix Zoo. I should have lifetime membership because of that ordeal. Several years ago, I was, took a group to hiking Fossil, Fossil Creek area, climbing up a, a wall of rocks, came over this ledge, four or five feet in front of me, a rattlesnake coiled. You could literally see my heart pounding in my chest. I slowly backed down that wall of rocks thinking I just saved my life. No one likes snakes. Moses jumps. It's amazing that he even obeyed Lord, the Lord to begin with. Moses, see that, see that staff in your hand? Now know, know this. Moses, for the first 40 years, held a scepter in his hand. A symbol of power an authority, a symbol that says, I'm the boss, you do what I tell you to do. He loses the scepter and now embraces a staff. Literally, a stick. And you know what a stick does? Absolutely nothing. 
God has brought this man from the royal courts of Egypt to the backside of the Midian wilderness and has given him a stick. But with the Lord, ordinary things can become extraordinary. You see that in your hand, Moses? Throw it on the ground. He obeys. So we don't have a total stubborn, jerky kind of dude here. Throws it on the ground. Becomes a snake. Whoa! Then God says, grab it by its tail. Now, there's another rule I know with snakes is that you don't grab a snake by the tail. But Moses obeys and does it, and it turns right back into a stick. No explanation. Then he says, take your hand, put it inside your cloak. He does it, pulls out his hand, it's covered with leprosy. Skin disease that was highly infectious, incurable, the most prominent disease in Egypt at this time. You got leprosy, you were forced to a life of seclusion and isolation forever. Moses is looking, God says, put it back, he puts it back, he pulls out, totally healed. God says, I've given you two signs. If they don't believe the first or the second, there's a third. You go ahead and get some water out of the river Nile. Throw it on the ground, turn it to blood. Now we have to stop and go, is God looking for the next David Copperfield? Yeah. Penn and Teller, who, <laughs> David Blaine, I don't know who. Like, is he just looking for magicians here? No, no, no. God is showing Moses something powerful. That he has power in three areas. And we're not going to deal with the fourth area, area until next time. So we'll, we'll land the plane with this one. God is saying with the sign of the snake, I have authority over opposition. If you think about it, the spirit animal of the Egyptians was the snake. The cobra was part of the headdress of every pharaoh. The tombs and the artifacts of Egypt are covered with snakes all over the place. The snake represented the authority and power of Egypt, and God is saying, I am more powerful than them. And not only that, ladies and gentlemen, you go back to the garden, and the enemy of God in the garden to lead Adam and Eve astray was the serpent. And ultimately, God says, there is enmity that exists between me and the serpent but guess who in the end comes out victorious? Amen? God can overthrow any opposition either he or his people may face. Don't you know how this thing ends? God is victorious. I was saying this the, the first service. I was like, one of the things I kind of am bitter, bittersweet about is like, if, if on a Sunday, you know, my favorite sports team's playing and that happens during church, which I never forsake you guys in light of sports just so you guys know even though you forsake me and you know I still love you and I forgive you but what happens is if I miss a game it's recorded and when it's recorded it's already been finished and now I have to just dodge people from telling me how it's end until I watch it myself but say the word slips out that says your team won I'm watching that game now with an entirely different mentality. Because with all the ups and downs, I'm a little bit calmer because I know how this thing ends. Versus not knowing how it ends and having my heart being torn to pieces. Ladies and gentlemen, I dare you to read the end of God's story. In the end, guess who wins? Come on, guys. We are more than conquerors in Christ. He is victor. His plan will prevail, and no one or nothing can thwart what the Lord has ordained. So Moses, what are you worried about? I am more powerful than Egypt. I am more powerful than any sickness or disease. Point number one, I have authority over sickness. You think leprosy is more powerful than me? Oh, you're mistaken. I have the power to take something that is impure and weak, defiling, and renew it and restore it. Oh, Moses, you don't know about me. Not only do I have authority over opposition or authority over sickness, I have authority over creation. You see that big river out there? 
that the Egyptians worship. The Nile was their God. The Nile was their source of life. And God said, I don't want them worshiping that body of water. I want them to worship the creator of that water. You think that the mountains and the trees and the oceans aren't under my control? Go ahead, take some of that water and throw it on the ground. Watch it turn to blood. And that's what does happen to our false idols. They end up being stinky, impure things that will destroy us in the end. And God says to Moses, what more do I have to show you? What more signs do you want? We want a sign. If we're honest, I sit there and go, yeah, sticks, hands, rivers, boring. God, give me a sign. Don't we all, we all kind of want a sign. Somehow we know that that maybe something isn't lining up right or something doesn't make sense. God, give me a sign. You know, around Christmas when you're at the mall and you've got that last minute shopping you need to do and you're praying, give me a spot close to the front door and if you do, I will serve you the rest of my life. You know that prayer that we all, we all utter at some point? Like, God, I know if you do this, you are real and you care about me. You know I'm looking for a husband. You know I'm looking for a wife. You know I'm blah, 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 blah. We, make the, we barter with God. And, give him, and we, get, we ask him to give us a sign. Let's just be honest. You and I are, are stubborn and rebellious enough. God will give us a sign and we'll still want something else. So let me just stop you from seeking signs and tell you that God has already given the greatest sign possible. You want to know what it is? Matthew chapter 12. Check this out. A sign has been given. He answered them. An evil and adulterous generation seek for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah, who, Jonah, was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish. So the Son of Man will be three days, three nights in the heart of the earth. Ladies and gentlemen, God has answered your prayer, and the sign has been given. The sign that God has given the greatest sign of all is the fact that Jesus Christ had been crucified, buried, and risen again on the third day. And you don't have to wait till Easter to celebrate this. He is risen! You know it. You know it. The sign has been given. How dare we ask God for something else? How dare we say to God, you haven't given me enough? How dare we go back to God and go, do something else. Prove yourself. You know what God will not do? He will not trump the greatest miracle ever in human history, and that is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Here's what God says to every single one of us. The empty tomb is the sign that Christianity is true and that you can trust God's word. The sign has been given. You are loved as you are where you are. With all your frailties, with all your weaknesses, with all your limitations. God loves you as you are right here today. But you also know something else? God's going to change you. He's saying, I I love you right now, but I'm going to make you into a better person. Now, again, it's not moral improvement. It's a close walk with your heavenly Father by the power of the Spirit in the name of Jesus Christ that your life is transformed and conformed into the image of Jesus. And there's no greater delight than to be changed into His image. God loves you. He accepts you. But He's not done with you yet. Moses is just starting out experiencing what God has in store for him. And Moses' journey is not unlike our journey. He's seeking us out in some obscure wilderness saying, come on, it's time to come out of isolation. It's kind of time to come out of loneliness. It's time to be a part of something bigger than you. And we're going to conclude this next time we're together. What God does in Moses' life 
over these next few verses is going to set him up for a lifetime of just getting to know this God who is too deep to ever, ever understand, too kind to ever take for granted, and too loving to not be moved by and melted by. Do you know this son, Jesus? Do you know him who is the way, the truth, and the life? There's no greater thing I can give you than that. Ladies and gentlemen, Christ is all you need. Why? Because Christ is all you'll have. Nothing else will measure up. And all God's people said. Uh, Moses, come out of the house with your hands on your head. We have a warrant for your arrest. Carson, come out of the house and surrender. We have a warrant for your arrest. David, Come out of your house with your hands on your head. All of us will eventually hear the voice of God saying, you're guilty and you can't get out of this. Barricade yourself in your self-righteousness. Barricade yourself in your self-absorption. Barricade yourself in your self-sufficiency. And what's that going to get you? Nowhere. Until you hear God say, come to the end of yourself and know that I am all you'll ever need. You'll never be truly free in Christ Jesus. Amen? Amen. Let's stand. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this beautiful day celebrating the life change that you continue to bring about. Thank you for baptisms. Thank you for just the expression that we get to share and sing, to dive into your word. Lord, to, to walk alongside a guy like Moses and realize that we're not much different. We need you. We're nothing without you. But yet with you, we have everything we need. That there's a joy and there's a satisfaction, there's a type of life that is offered by you to us that will never disappoint, never leave us short, never leave us empty, never leave us hungry. Lord, I, I, I pray because I know this about myself. I'm naked and I'm poor and I'm weak and I'm fragile and there's nothing to this whole relationship with you that I'm able to bring except for a broken heart and bended knee and say, I need you. Forgive me for my stubbornness. Forgive me for my reluctancy. And move my heart to trust and love the great I am. You are more than enough. You are more than sufficient. You are my everything. Remind us all of that as we journey together today. Guide our steps and may our heart long for your glory and nothing else. Thank you for the gathering. Thank you for being our God. Thank you for giving us your son in whom those who believe have eternal life. What a great gift. And we pray this all in His name. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord lift His face toward you and give you His grace and peace forever and ever. Amen. Love you guys. Have a great day. See you soon.